Well, what a weekend it has been. So there's not, there's like, I have no news. So this episode is purely just two reviews. One review of a movie and one review of a wrestling show. So let's start off with the movie because the movie happened first. And then we'll get into Forbidden Door. So Lightyear, I got to see Lightyear this week uh, on Saturday. Went to a different movie theater than the one I normally went to. This one had reclining chairs. Ooh, woo. Uh, and I got to go see Lightyear. Uh, so they, they, the movie starts out by straight up saying, In 1995, a kid named Andy got a Buzz Lightyear action figure. It was based off his favorite movie. This is that movie. So, you know, this is the in-universe movie for Buzz Lightyear that inspired the toy. Uh, the movie really starts off, I think, very well. I was really liking the movie for, like, the very first two acts, I would say. <laughs> like, when, uh, we have the opening thing where they reveal why they're marooned on the planet. They reveal that Buzz... Uh, Buzz keeps trying to get to... This is going to be a bit spoilery. I'm going to try not to spoil everything, but I may spoil a bit. Uh, Buzz keeps trying to get their fuel to get them into hyperspeed. Uh, but he keeps failing. And every time he fails, he's like gone for like four years. Uh, and I like that because they're showing that, you know, Buzz is missing out on his friends' lives. Like, they're having their own lives here on the planet while he just keeps missing every four years. Um, I did like that. And then we did get to the part that there is parts in the movie that make you kind of smile. Like, they have the line of him going, you're mocking me, aren't you? You know, they have that in there. He does the mission logs. Uh, you know, so the stuff they're like, ah, oh, that's why it's in the toy. You know, the laser pointer on the toy that is eventually factored into the movie. Uh, because he needs a weapon and someone just tosses him it. Uh, but I feel like when we got to him meeting. And this is in the trailers. When he goes so far into the future that he meets his friend's granddaughter. Is when this movie really went downhill. Because before it, I was ready to give this like a 9. No, not 9. I would, that wouldn't actually go that strong. About an 8. I think an 8. I was like, this is a really good movie. I'm really liking this. And then he met the granddaughter and the movie went downhill. Because it just turned awful because that's when Buzz meets his crew, you know? Which consists of... I believe her name is Izzy, right? Izzy Haw Hawthorne, I think. I don't know. She's fine. She's their standard. I want to be just like my grandma because my grandma was a great person. I want to be just like her. But she's awful at her job. Then there's a guy played by Taika Watiti. And oh my god, he is the most insufferable loser. It's not even funny, like, loser. Like, he causes all the trouble. Because he stumbles over uh, equipment that causes, like, something bad to happen. Uh, he alerts the enemies to them because he's an incompetent idiot. And then they try to make him like, you know, like the funny, clumsy guy. He's not funny. He's just stupid and annoying. I found him to be utterly insufferable. He was ruining the movie for me. Uh, and then there was like this old lady who she was uh, like in jail, in prison. And she's here to cut time off her sentence. 
And she's all about explosives and bangs. She wasn't that bad, actually. Not as bad as the other two. Out of the three people Buzz meets, she's the least annoying. Um, But God, man, like they were just insufferable. And then we get to the part with Zerg. Very excited to see Zerg. How are we going to handle Zerg? There's a reveal to Zerg. And it's not good. It's really not good. It, it, I was scratching my head like, why are you doing this to Zerg? You're ruining Zerg. The Zerg reveal is not good. It's really not good. And it might have also helped to ruin this movie. Um, this movie gets very by, not very like, oh, it's coincidental. Like, it's kind of like, no, there's no way that would happen. No, there's no way that would happen. It's like, I would like some logic, please, in this movie. There's a point where Zerg grabs Buzz and Zerg wants the crystal that they, the crystal core that they need that will help them get to hyperspeed. And he asks Buzz, where's the crystal, you know? It's like, it's right under you. Buzz literally placed the core down on the, like, right under you. Just look down. It's right there. Like, oh my god. Uh. Yeah, this, this movie had so much potential. It could have been a great movie. It really could have. But it did not reach expectations. And I heard it's flopped at the box office two weeks in a row. So uh, that says it all, doesn't it? That I'm not the only one who feels this way. There are lots of other people who feel this way. Uh, it may not have also helped that Chris Evans called the audience idiots. Great job, buddy. That's going to do great with the audience. They're going to definitely want to watch your movie now. Idiot. You're the idiot. <laughs> Moron. Um... Yeah, I give Lightyear like six and a half out of ten. Maybe a six. Straight up just a six out of ten. Um, yeah. It's such a shame, man. It's a real shame because I wanted this movie to be really good. And it just sadly wasn't. And that's another movie I've seen this year that sadly just was disappointing the other one was Doctor Strange like rating this I'm like would, would I rather watch this movie again or the Downton Abbey movie and I would gladly watch the Downton Abbey movie over this again so far the best rated movie I've seen this year is The Batman and Constantine House of Mystery and Constantine is like not even really a movie it's like 30 minutes. It's like a TV episode. So I guess technically The Batman is the best movie I've seen this year with an 8.5 rating. Well, the next movie I want to see is Bullet Train. So let's hope Bullet Train does well. Like, let me see Bullet Bullet Train. When does it come out? The 15th. I want to see the bullet train. I want to see bullet train. So. Uh, hopefully that movie's good. And it's not bad. Yeah. Bullet train and Green Lantern. Beware my power are my three. Are my two summer movies. And they're both in July. After that I don't got any more movies this summer. So. That sucks. Anyway. Uh, moving on. Let's have some fun now. Forbidden Door was yesterday. And Forbidden Door was a dang good show. Is what it was. So, we kicked off with uh, Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, and Minoru Suzuki versus Eddie Kingston, Wheeler Yuta, and Shota Umino. Uh, the winning team will get the man advantage at Blood and Guts on Wednesday. That was a nice little addition. This match, I'm going to straight up say it, this is my match of the night. Nothing topped this for me. Nothing topped this match for me. Uh, they, I did not know this. It's Shota 
Umino's father's red shoes. And they showed back when Jericho fought Kenny that Jericho pushed red shoes. He put Shota, who was a young lion at the time, in the walls. Once that happened, though, I did know, okay, Shota's got to put Jericho in the walls. If Shota doesn't put Jericho in the walls, then what even is this? You know? Um... Obviously, he put Jericho in the walls, and it was great. This match was utterly fantastic. So many stuff. Sammy does a freaking shooting star onto Shota on the floor. Eddie Kingston did a tope suicida. I've never seen Eddie Kingston do anything like that before. Suzuki teased, oh, he's going to do it. And then he did the heel thing where he stopped. He's like, I'm not doing any high five moves. What the hell? <laughs> Uh, Jericho got the win by hitting um, the Judas effect on Shota Umino. So, the Jericho Appreciation Society has the one-man advantage heading into Blood and Guts, which I'm so looking forward to, man. This this match was match of the night. I am so, I'm so re-watching this. I'm so re-watching this match. Uh, the next match was the winner-take-all match, which was... United Empire Great Okab, uh, FTR and Rapongi Vice triple threat tag match for both the IWGP and ROH tag titles. This match was real good, man. This match was really good. However, the beginning did derail it quite a bit. So, FTR are doing a tag team move, and Dax grabs his elbow and i'm like oh no he tags out immediately goes down to the floor and the doctor checks out i'm like oh no 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 and then he's escorted to the back and i went damn it he's got he's injured and i'm like well how's that gonna affect the match i mean ftr is probably supposed to win this and for a while i wasn't really paying attention to the match because i'm like oh no ftr is freaking donezo they're going to have to vacate everything. Thankfully, Dax came back. Huge pop to Dax coming back with his shoulder taped up. He's back. Uh, he started doing suplexes. And I'm like, okay, this might have been a work. Because there ain't no way you, you've got like a what looked like a dislocated shoulder. And you're doing suplexes. There ain't no way. So maybe it was a work. I don't know. I'm not going to assume. Uh, but once Dax came back is when I fully started to get into this match. Like, okay, here we go. Great stuff from all three teams, man. Seriously. Jeff Cobb doing the standing uh, moonsault's great. That's just great. Uh, but in the end, FTR nailed, I believe, Rocky Romero with the uh, big rig. And won their third tag team title belts. They are now the AAA... They are now the ROH and the IWGP Tag Team Championships. You know what's next, right, boys? FTR versus the Bucks 3 for the AEW Tag Titles. Next up, we had another four. Oh, we had a, a four way Malachi Black versus Pac versus Miro versus Clark Connors, who is stepping in for Tomohiro Ishii because Ishii got injured. Damn it! Uh, to crown the inaugural All Atlantic Championship, I had Malachi Black going into this match. This match was awesome. Clark Connors got nothing when he came out, but by the end of it, the crowd was cheering for him. Which that just goes to show you how well uh, Connors did. He did really well. Uh, Miro was just no selling everything because <laughs> he's Miro. Malachi Black, this man and his kicks are deadly. Great spot in the match where both Black and Miro are beating up Pac. And Malachi's like, I want to beat him up. And, Ma uh, and Miro's like, no, I want to beat him up. And they did tug of war with Pac to see who could beat him up. That's great. I love that. Um, and then they start fighting each other. It looked like Miro was going to win. Oh, well, I should say there was a spot where 
Clark Connors speared Miro through a table, which was really nice. And that's when Clark got his huge pop and started to go crazy. Uh, and then there was a spot where it looked like Miro was going to win. Where he had Pac in the uh, game over. Then Malachi Black comes in and he missed Miro in the eyes. And I'm like, oh my god, Malachi's going to win. He's going to do it. But no, sadly no. Clark Connors came in and ruined it. Um, Malachi then had Connors in like a, an arm bar. Pac hit a 450 on both of them. And then he locked Connors in the Brutalizer. And one Pack is the first ever All-Atlantic Championship. Uh, wow. Dude. Um, not my first choice. I was a bit like, whoa, you gave it to him? But I'm like, whatever, man. Because Pack's great. So, yeah, all right, I'm down with Pac winning the belt. I think he'll do great. Uh, then we had Bullet Club of the Young Bucks and El Fantasma taking on Sting, Darby, and Shingo in a trios match. Uh, it was a trios match because uh, Hiromu was sick and couldn't show up. So, you know, there's that. Uh, but we started off hot before the bell even rang, dude. Sting didn't show up for his entrance, so I was like, where's Sting? And I'm thinking, oh, the Bucks probably attacked him. So the Bucks come out with El Phantasmo to uh, Bullet Club. And they got the old Bullet Club attire on. And then the lights go out. And then in the rafters, it's Sting! It's not really Sting, it's a stand-in. The lights go out again, the lights come back on. Sting's on top of the tunnel and he jumps off it onto all freaking four men. Because Hikaleo was still there, but he was just, like, in their corner. Uh, this match was great. Uh, not the best match on the card, as I've seen some people say. I feel like, at this point, this was the weakest match of the card. But it's still good, right? Like, it, it's like, it, it, it's still good. Uh... There was a funny backbreaker spot where everyone was backbreaking, like Darby and the crowd is playing along with it, like acting like it's the most devastating thing in the world. Sting hit uh, double Scorpion Death Drops on the Bucks. He and El Phantasmo had like a little rivalry going on this whole match. El Phantasmo did a nipple twist to Sting and Sting no sold it, and then when he did one to El Phantasmo, it was great. Uh, and in the end, in the end, Shingo hit the. It wasn't made in Japan. It was something else uh, on Connors to get the win for the faces. So yeah, good, good match. Oh, Sting also no sold the super kick party, which was which was something. Uh, then we had the match I didn't give a damn about, which was Thunder Rosa versus Tony Storm for the AEW Women's Title. I'm gonna be honest with you, I didn't watch the match. Straight up, didn't wa watch the match. It wasn't because I didn't want to. It was because I was tired at this point. Because if I had like so many good matches and I needed a break. <laughs> and this was the break. Um, so at this point I went and got myself another drink and was putting away dishes. And then when I finished, uh, Thunder Rosa won by using Dustin Rhodes's um Dustin Rhodes finish on Tony Storm, which is stupid. Uh and Thunder Rosa retained. Boo. Uh I hope we get another one between these two. And uh, then Tony Storm can win. Orange Cassidy challenges Will Ospreay for the IWGP US title. Um, Juice Robinson was there. I mean, obviously, because Tony Storm's there. So, obviously, he's going to be there. And he had the belt. And he's like, this ain't for the belt. This is just a number one contenders match. So, we have our number one contender. Uh... Like I said, man, people who thought Orange Cassidy and Will wouldn't have a good match, they were proven wrong because this was a damn good match. Because Orange Cassidy was actually wrestling. Like I told you, he can. This was fantastic, man. There was a spot where Orange Cassidy was doing like little, little kicks. Like, like, like little kicks to him and, uh, you know, the Orange Cassidy kicks. And then Will kind of pushes him and then he's like, okay, and he does actual kicks to his head. Great. 
And they did uh, Will Ospreay trying to go for the hidden blade a lot. And then Orange Cassidy kept falling down or he kept dodging it. That was the story. But eventually, Will did hit the hidden blade. And I guess retained his um his title. I don't know. <laughs> or he's number one contender. Whatever. Um, there was a fantastic spot in this match. I'm now remembering this. Where Orange Cassidy, you know like the little turnbuckle cam they have? He grabbed Will Ospreay's face and just pushed him into it and the camera broke. And then there was a spot. Will Ospreay went for a moonsault on Orange. Orange moved. Uh... Will went for another moonsault, like the Andrade moonsault, where he goes for the moonsault, the guy moves, and he does another one immediately after. He went for that. Cassie dodged both, so then Will just hit a court. Uh, Will then just hit a shooting star press. Awesome. Awesome. Then we had the mystery opponent of Zack Sabre Jr. versus the newest member of the Blackpool Combat Club. It could only be one man, and it was that man. Claudio Castagnoli has debuted at AEW. And he is a member of the Blackpool Combat Club. This match was great. This match started. And immediately, Claudio runs at Zack Sabre, hits him with an uh, an elbow and a neutralizer, and he, al he almost won the match right there. <laughs> great match, man. Uh, they were teasing the spin a lot. Um... And Zack Sabre kept getting out of it, which was like the big thing where like the crowd wants uh, the spin. But Zack's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure you don't get the spin. And shockingly, Casting Noli won with the Ricola Bomb. I expected Zack Sabre Jr. to win. But uh, no. Uh, Claudia won. All right. Cool. And he's going to be taking Ryan's place at Blood and Guts. So that'll be great. We get to see him again. Then we had the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship match. Jay White defends against Adam Page, Okada, and Adam Cole. Okada had like the biggest pop of the goddamn night, dude. Oh my god. <laughs> this dude came out the crowd one unglued. Before the match even started, uh, the crowd was chanting, you know, holy S before anyone had fought each other. Uh, this match was great. I loved this match. Uh... The story was like Adam Cole and Jay White were working together against uh, Adam Page and Okada. Then eventually, of course, you know, when Adam Cole saw his moment, he turned on Jay White. Fittingly enough, hitting him with a backstabber. And from then on, it was, a, you know, all four men were going after each other. There was no Rainmaker this match, and I'm very sad. I'm very sad there was no Rainmaker. What's some buckshots? And there was no Panama Sunrise uh, either. Uh, and I think the big thing we have to talk about is the finish. Uh, Okada hit the landslide, which is like a Michinoku driver. Uh, well, no, it's more of a Samoan driver. Uh, on Adam Cole, Jay White comes in, hits the Blade Runner on Okada. Okada rolls out the ring. Jay White then pins Adam Cole and wins, and it looked like Adam Cole tried to kick out. And I'm like, that's a botched finish? What the hell? However, very quickly after that finish, a doctor rolled in the ring to check on Adam Cole, and it has now been revealed he has a concussion. So that's like, okay, yeah. He got injured, and that was it. Uh, which sucks, man, because it was this was such a good match. And it sucks that has to have a crappy finish. And then we have the main event, John Moxie versus Tanahashi Hiroshi for the interim AEW World Championship. Man, I was freaking rooting for Tanahashi this whole match. And I wasn't the only one. Because there was a spot where Moxie had him in like the... He had him in a sleeper. And the crowd was like cheering like go ace go ace go ace for him to get up and there was a point where moxie started putting elbows to him and um the crowd was booing the crowd was with me they knew tadahashi should have won because he didn't 
Moxie hit him with a paradigm shift in one. Moxie gigged as well and got super bloody. Th I, uh, why? <laughs> you didn't need to. He put Tanahashi through the timekeeper table and I got to hear him say, get the F out the way. Um, yeah, so Moxie's interim champ. I'm not against it, but I, I would have preferred Tanahashi. And then I, after the match, the Jericho Appreciation Society came out and started beating them up. And then it turned to a huge brawl. I'm like, do we need this again? You did this on Dynamite. You did this on Rampage. I don't need this again. So I was very against the brawl. Because I'm like, you do this like... This is the third time this week. You've done it. So... But that was Forbidden Door. Uh, I should also say they had their Jap the New Japan announcer uh, doing Japanese announcements after Justin Roberts. Which is so awesome and i'm glad they did that but that was forbidden door overall i give forbidden door like an 8 out of 10 i think it is the weakest aew pay-per-view of the year but it's still just fan freaking fantastic man seriously still awesome i would absolutely watch it again in a heartbeat